Welcome to Robert Bellissimo at the Movies. This is a YouTube video podcast where we explore storytelling on film, as well as interviews with industry professionals who work in film, television, and theater amongst various areas of the arts. It is my honor to welcome today Harry Northup, who is an actor and poet. He has appeared in many films and television shows and has worked several times with some of the greatest American filmmakers of all time, such as Martin Scorsese, Jonathan Kaplan, and Jonathan Demi. Some of his credits include Who's That Knocking at My Door, Boxcar Bertha, Mean Streets, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Taxi Driver, Over the Edge, Silence of the Lambs, among many, many more. Welcome, Harry. Thanks so much again for joining me. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you, Robert. It's such an it's such an honor to have you because so many movies you've been in have been you know my all time favorite. So it's it's hard to believe I'm talking to anyone who even stepped foot on the set of, of Taxi Driver or uh, who's that knocking at my door. But before we we jump into that, because I, I know you were born in Amarillo, Texas, and you live mostly in Nebraska. I was just I was curious what did your what did your parents do? My dad. You know, in the 20s, he had a general store in Denver. And then as a lot of people did when the depression hit, you know, the uh, business folded. So he started working for the civil service. So we would live, you know, you know, we lived in Hastings, Nebraska, where there was, believe it or not, a Navy base. Most of the time we lived in Sydney, Nebraska, or Seward and Steppo right outside, which was an army base. Uh, as you mentioned, I was born in Amarillo, Texas. My dad was working at Northwest Hospital. Uh, we lived in Idaho. You know, we lived in, I lived in 17 places by the time I was 17. So, I, you know, one good thing about those years in the 50s and 40s, you could move and you, the, uh, the, what would you call it, the, the classes that they had in schools, whether Ohio, Idaho, Nebraska, they were all pretty uniform. And so I always did pretty good in school. So thank you for asking me about that. And and so once you once you wanted to become an actor, I was curious what what did your how did your parents feel about that? You know, when I was young, I wanted to be I was you know I played baseball in every league from age five to seventeen, and then I joined the Navy out of high school. I did acting when I was fourteen. My first acting job, Community Playhouse, the Panhandle Players in Western Nebraska, and then. Uh, two years later, I played the lead, George, George in uh, our town. Mm -hmm. And then I did the lead in uh, the junior class play. So I did theater, but I, when I joined the, you know, as I said, I want to be a baseball player for the Yankees and my eyes weren't really that good enough. So I joined the Navy. And then when I was in the Navy, I thought, well, what I'll do is save some money and become an English teacher, go to college. And so I went to California, uh, Kearney, Nebraska Teachers College. And I got, uh, you know, I was, I was doing the studies and all that. And then I saw there was an audition for Othello in the fall of 1961. And so I auditioned for it and I got the part of Cassio. And then from that moment on, I wanted to be an actor. So I never really, you know, my parents never even really uh, talked to me about that. You know, I was just one of these persons who just went with my passion. Right, right. No, that's good. That's that's a good way to to, to go about life. Uh, was it was it rough living in uh, in New York when when you were there and the, got there in the sixties? Because I know in the sixties, I recently just read a book about the history of New York um, cinema and and how the the how it influenced the politics of the day and vice versa. And it was it was pretty rough then. So I was curious what it was like to live there for you in the the sixties. You know, in 1962, I quit college the second semester. I went to New York City. I hitchhiked to New York City, and I slept sitting up in the bus station. I think it was 34th and 8th. It could have been 50th and 8th. And I auditioned for summer stock during the daytime. I would shave in the men's room, and I always wore, you know, suit and tie. And then I, I didn't get a job. I went back home, and I was playing baseball on the town team, and I got a call from a producer to come to Lake Whalen Playhouse, Fitchburg, Mass. So I got my equity card and then I went back to college. I quit again. Then I went to New York for good in 63. So to answer your question, it was pretty good at that time. I got a, there was a hotel on 48th and 8th called the Court Hotel and it was $16 a week. So, you know, yeah. places to live were pretty cheap. And also at that time, I saw a lot of films. It was, you know, New York City, obviously an education. 
And I saw films at the Thalia, the New Yorker, the Weberly Place, the Paris, Little Carnegie. So I saw all of these foreign films, you know, like uh, 400 Blows, mm. Breathless, um, last year at Marion Bod, among oh. others. So yeah. it was really, for me, it was, it really was, you know, obviously it's tough because you live in a city where you don't know anybody. I just know a couple of people from summer stock. So the difficulty was, you know, I would get some odd job uh, while I went to acting class. And so it was, I think about New York City, even probably today, which much more expensive, as long as you have one thing, which for me was acting, studying acting, looking for acting work, it, you can let all the, you know, the, I don't know what the opulence and whatever, the suit that comes up, gets your shirts dirty and let that go off your back. As long as you have just that one desire to focus and do your work. Mm -hmm. And what sort of, cause I know you worked as a, as a messenger. Do you remember other kind of side jobs you, you did? Yeah. The first job was a messenger right off fifth Avenue, 41st street, the Quicksilver messenger service. I used to get breakfast on the way there. It was neat. If you'd get a cup of coffee, a powdered donut, and a watered-down orange juice for 25 cents. <laughs> Beautiful. I worked, as, I worked as a waiter in the Friars Club. I mean, if you mm. wanted to be a professional waiter, you know, that would be the place. I worked there for three months before I came to LA with my first wife. I worked as a clerk typist. I worked as a swatch boy you know, in, the fa in the, what do you call it, the fashion district, 23rd and 5th. And then I would, uh, you know, get a job at a counter, counterman at night, you know, six to nine, make like three bucks and get chips and a food and have my days open for acting class and looking for acting work. So, you know, sometimes I get a job and I get an audition and I just quit mm. and, you know, start all over again. Do you, because I, I know that you studied with uh, Frank Cosaro, the, who taught uh, method acting. Um, you had some, some really great actors in that class too, Harvey Keitel, uh, Christopher Jones, uh, you know, Christopher Jones is someone I, on, I had only heard about a couple of years ago. And uh, we did, I, I did some videos on him and it, it, it's proven to be quite popular. People really are interested in Christopher Jones, I guess. So I was curious, I was curious if you had anything, any recollections of him? You know, when I was in class, as you said, Chris was there, he always, you know, kind of looked like a James Dean character. He always yeah, he wore does, yeah. real nice black, Italian shirts, Italian pants, or navy blue, and and he, you know, he he was he got into actor studio around that time, and he always liked me. I always liked him. I asked Frank Corsero one time, uh, as you mentioned, there were a lot of great actor students at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I said, "What do you think of Chris as an actor?" He says he's a good actor, but he's lazy. And then in 1965. He came out here, as you probably know, to do Jesse James. Yes. A friend of mine told me to give him a buzz. So I, as I said, I was in New York at the time. I called him. He said, come out here and I'll get you a, a meeting with David Weisbart, who was a producer of that show for the part of Frank James. So I flew out. I had enough money for a plane ticket. And I stayed with a cousin in West Covina. I took a couple buses to the Strip and talked to him at the Chateau Marmar. And then I went to 20th to meet David Weisbart. And then that was on Tuesday. And then I didn't hear anything. And then I called Thursday and they said they gave it to Alan Case, a Broadway actor. So I hitchhiked back to New York on Friday with $4 in my pocket and uh, took me four days and nights. And then I saw Chris a few times once I came out here at a, act, uh, at a West Hollywood coffee shop that a bunch of us actors used to hang out. And he still would always wear that navy blue Western cowboy shirt, and he still looked good. He he didn't his face was a little more tighter mm. than I, than earlier, but he was always um, you know a charismatic guy. Yeah, I, when 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 uh, Frank said he was lazy, what do you think he meant by that? Just that he did, wasn't prepared for class well enough. Well, you know, I never really saw him do an acting scene in class. Okay. We were always doing, as you mentioned, in that acting class that was. You, you know, there was Harvey Keitel, Christopher Jones, Ralph Wade, Lane Smith, Salome Jens, Richard Bradford, Bobby Walden, Hector Elizondo, you know, a few others. There were about a, at least a dozen of us that all made our le livelihood as actors. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, there's some uh, um, some really interesting stories uh, uh, about him on when he worked on Ryan's Daughter, and then he 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 quit acting after that. Did did you did you ever see him over the years after that, or has it 
after 1970? I don't know if you, when he quit acting or. You know, as I said, well, you know, I saw him when I came out to LA in 68, I saw him yeah. with, his, with his manager and he just said, to, oh, Harry's a wild actor and this and that. And then I, I saw him, you know, at the, as I said, at the Silver Spoon later on in the 80s and the 90s. Okay. Yeah, I would see him in there. He was, he was kind of a laid back guy. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I really don't know uh, much about him. I know I had heard that uh, Quentin had offered him a job in yeah. one of those pictures. And he yeah, turned Pulp, it Pulp Fiction, yeah. 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 And, and I know that you were, were friendly with Harvey Keitel, and, and, and he introduced you to Scorsese, which then uh, got you the part in, of, of course, I have it here as well, Who's That Knocking at My Door, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a really, really good uh, debut feature from uh, Scorsese. So um, I love this story about, when you met Scorsese and you had worked with uh, Robert Rawson on another film I love, Lilith, which I also have here. Um, and you talked about your mutual love of uh, The Hustler. Uh, did he ask you to read anything? Was there a, was it a formal audition or what, did he just say you got it because you guys both hit it off? Yeah, I have never read for Scorsese, you know, six first, his first six films, his first TV show. I only read one time for Demi. 10 shows and that was because Oprah was a producer of uh what was it Beloved right uh, Kaplan I I uh I did for Over the Edge I had to audition five times for that but to get back to Scorsese I remember meeting him on 42nd Street and he was using the office of either Jonas Makis or um some other guy who Andrew Saris and right. we talked about working with you know me and Harvey and Corsero's class we talked about where he was from, where I was from. I told him that I got my SAG card in Lilith, Robert Rawson. And one thing I loved about Robert Rawson, the same thing about Scorsese, Robert Rawson would go up and talk to Beatty or Peter Fonda, you know, very quietly, almost like a trainer talking to his boxer, just uh, privately. And that's the way Scorsese was. And then years later, as we both know, Scorsese did an adaptation of that uh, Color of Money. But I love, uh, I love yes. the hustle. Oh yeah, yeah. No, me too. Did you? So I know that. Just look. I just wanted to touch on Lilith because I know, as you said, they uh, they they wanted to have actors play the the patients in in the mental hospitals. Um, so I know you were there a couple of days a week for for a, a number of for a for a period of time, and then that's how you got your SAG card. Did you uh, have much interactions with uh, Rawson or Warren Beatty or Gene Seberg or? You know, the only thing I remember about Robert Ross, and we were shooting out on the island, Long Island, and I remember talking to him one time, and he said he would, we were talking about the Hollywood 10, and he said he would, would have been one of them, but he was in Mexico at the time. But I really didn't, you know, I was playing a small part, and at that time, they had a phrase called psychodrama. Mm. You know, they didn't want to just hire extras, they wanted to hire actors who could, you know, come up with something. And there were Olymp Olympia Dukakis. She was also yes. in that picture. So it was just really a, a gateway to get my equity part. And I would say the first real part that I had in film was Scorsese's Who's That Knocking at My Door? And, and that was right. important to me on, on, on many levels. But the one level that I would just like to bring up is I, you know, being a theater actor, I always looked at the scenes that I was going to do was just a, a long arc, you know, rise and a fall. And then I, you know, Scorsese said, okay, you drive up here, stop, back up, drive up here, stop, back up, get that shot, then turn, go in here, stop, get that, back up, try it again. Then, you know, all the technical things. And I learned that film was, you know, shot in pieces. Right. And yet, as the actor, you have to maintain, sustain that emotional, uh, whatever it is emotionally that's going inside of you. Right. And that was uh, probably one of the most important lessons that I learned from film. And it was a, it was a very small crew that was Scorsese. You know, he had a knit cap on and looked kind of like D.W. Griffith in way down East. And then he, <laughs> uh, Michael Wadley, you know, Woodstock, he was the, yes. and there were maybe two or three other people. I remember right, you know, we shot at night at Haig Manusian's farmhouse. He was the head of NYU cinema school at that time. And then, uh, Scorsese's mom, you know, cooked pasta, you know, right before, you know, six o'clock, whatever. And then we waited till it was dark. So that was a, that was a great memory. 
do did you did you have much interaction with his parents because they're such they're such characters his parents were lovely and those in the italian american documentary and <laughs> various movies did you do you remember much about Kat, his mother or father you know i really don't i do remember you know you probably seen it that one documentary did in the mid 70s yeah. italian american italian american yeah and there's a scene where his mom is sitting on the sofa and his dad is on the sofa and Marty's over here shooting it and talking. And then all of a sudden his mom says to Marty, Marty and pointed to her husband, Charlie, he's putting on, yeah. you know, meaning like he's exaggerating a little bit. Right. So I thought, well, that's probably where Scorsese gets his sense of storytelling and <laughs> a certain intimacy of reality, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think so. You you said something that uh, I thought was really interesting that you you could tell from that first film that Scorsese was a born director. So wh what was it about how he was on set that gave you that feeling? You know, one thing I think about Marty is he always, you know, in the beginning, he didn't know a lot about acting. He loved film. Obviously, we all know he's like, you know, he's a film historian to me, maybe not by the academic, uh, you know, whatever credentials right he just knew so much about film and he had so much confidence and he just uh he would always in all the films i work with him probably today it's different because of uh you know the videos and all that but say he would be right between the camera and the sound and he would usually be crouching down listening and you could always see him out of the corner of your eye and you could see his response like if he would you know stifle a laugh that you were making him laugh and but he just had so much knowledge and love of cinema mm. and everything was just so much confidence right so that's what i that's what i believe so so right after this that now he the the next film you did with him was boxcar bertha which roger corman uh produced do do you did you notice anything change about his uh, his approach scorsese uh, on the next film was he different at all in terms of how he directed or what was that like you know, I don't think he's ever been, I don't think he's ever been different. Uh, one thing that you may know, he said the second film was the first time he had a crew. Right. And he had like, you know, 32, 34 days, whatever the shooting schedule was. So that, and then he said, Corman told him to shoot the toughest scenes first, those train scenes. But he was, he was always great. The thing about Marty, he loves actors. And he, you know, I was talking with Barry Primus, who did a, several of his pictures and also worked for, for Kazan in the theater about the difference between the two, which he declined to answer. But I thought those two are the best with actors I've ever seen. Kazan may be the best, but uh, Scorsese just, he would hire you and he would want you as you are. Right. I, I believe great directors are great observers. Mm -hmm. He would want you to be somebody else. He just knew who you were, your range, your possibilities. And uh, I think that's it right there, the power of observation. And he won, you know, the thing I noticed about Kaplan and Scorsese and, and uh, Demi, they, these great directors, they always want you to contribute. Right, right. So that's, uh, that makes you feel better. They trust you. And, and then you do as much preparation as you can. And, and you, you offer, and usually they say yes. Yeah. Well, you, you can certainly feel that in, in, uh, all the, all the three directors you you mentioned, Kaplan, Demi, and Scorsese, you can certainly feel that from uh, the performances in 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 all so many of their, so many of their films, if not all of them. Um, you jump, you know, and then of course, right after that, you you did uh, Mean Streets, and what I love so much about that performance is, I mean, to me, it it may be the best you know uh, non dialogue performance I've ever seen because <laughs> it's so it's so. Um, it's actually quite frightening. I mean, you get this this veteran who who comes back uh, from from Vietnam, and there's you know this party that they're throwing for for you, and it seems like a happy occasion, and then suddenly just that that burst of of violence um, where you where you you know you tear down the cake and and att attack you know you go out that woman you're throwing around um, was that. So uh, this is, I, I, I wouldn't, if you don't mind sharing the story of how you, because that was something you came up with. Is that right? Well, you know, Victor Argo, who's also did a bunch of Scorsese's films. Yes. Now, we would talk a lot about acting. And so I, I got the part and, you know, Marty said, I want you to play this. And I said, fine. I looked at the script and it was just a guy, Jerry comes home, uh, you know, gets drunk, you know, falls over into the cake and he's wearing his suit like the other guys. And I told Marty, I said, 
you know, I, I worked on three days downtown LA, Westlake and Six. And I said, Marty, I'm a little bit older than these guys and I would like to wear a, a uniform. He said, great, you know, just coming home from Vietnam. That was number one. Then what I've always thought about acting is you get a role and you try to make an active role out of a passive one. Mm. And so I came up with the idea that you just mentioned. And then uh, uh, I remember when the LA, the New York Times review came out, Vincent Canby said the scene where the Vietnam vet Harry Northup comes home and uh, destroys his own homecoming is one of the most mysteriously sorrowful moments in recent American cinema. Mm. So, uh, I told Marty what I wanted to do, and he said, great. And uh, so I told him I would smash the cake, tear up the tables, and then, as you said, you know, attack this woman. And it was really a, you know, a guy coming home from Vietnam and just, uh, you know, and the other thing, the two things I heard from Scorsese one time when he was given an interview around that time, he said, the, the guy who's going to commit mayhem is always that poor schmuck in the background that nobody's paying any attention to. It's not the guys that are joining. And the other thing was that um, Scorsese, uh, I don't know, I can't remember the other thing. Pauline Kael mentioned about how he puts things together and allows it to erupt out of its own volition. Right. And so with those, oh, oh, the other thing was that, as you mentioned, I looked at it and it was like a picnic, you know, all these guys coming in, art thou king of the Jews, I come mm. to bring all of this and that. And so I said, I'm going to turn their picnic into a nightmare. Right. And then, and then the great thing about that, too, was that, you know, the way Scorsese shoots and then edits right after that happened, you cut to the back room was Harvey Keitel, Charlie dancing with the girl. Yes. Yes. It's been attacked and it was very tender. So he has that. Uh, he has that, you know, the just the way that he puts things together, compresses things. Right. Right. So so I imagine that that dance that he has with the woman who, who then runs away from you, I imagine that came out of, out of what you had done, right? So that, that obviously wasn't in the script until you came up with the idea to, you know, bust up the party. I don't know if you would re remember or not. I don't remember that. The only thing okay. that I remember is, you know, the DP was uh, Kent Wakeford. Yeah. He also shot Alice. And I told him, cause he was, you know, he had a camera shaped to him or, you know, what do you call it? belted to him and uh like a he steady was camera. followed yeah pet, yeah and, uh, so i told him yeah and i told him i said there are only two cakes so just <laughs> keep it in frame <laughs> right right yeah no that's that's such a that's such a wonderful frightening scene and i i imagine you felt like what did you did you feel that this character would do that obviously because of what he had been through with vietnam so it was sort of like a uh, PTSD experience is that what you what you had in mind or that was the way I found it in the yeah. script in terms of me it was also I made a personal choice within me you know to uh, you know like an objective correlative and um, so I just uh, you know focused on that right right no it's a uh, uh, it's such a such a great such a great scene um, and then when you did uh, Alice doesn't live here anymore uh, which I also, which I also have here. Well, but you, you, you had mentioned that you had auditioned. Was it for for Ellen Burson's husband, or was it for the Harvey Keitel part initially? You know, no, it was. Uh, you know, I had had my I had my I think it was my third book of poetry published uh, a couple of months before that. And Scorsese came to the reading. It was at a the Bridge in East Hollywood, and after there were about eighty people there. After it was over, he came up to me. He said, "I have a part for you for my next film." And he said somewhat like Boxcar Bertha. So he called me in to Warner Brothers and I auditioned for the part Billy Bush did. And at one time he was thinking of having me at the, that part and Billy Bush in the Chris Christopherson part. And I had, okay. uh, I had just split up with my wife and this feeds into Mean Streets too. I had all that anger within me. And right. so that was like Mean Streets, the same thing in this one. And so I probably was a little too much. And I went home and I called up Marty and I said, you know, I, I'm better than that. I, I, I think I, I did too much. And he said, that's all right. So I know you're a good actor. And then he decided to give, you know, Chris Christopherson, movie star, to play the man that she ends up with and Billy Bush that. And, I, I, you know, an interesting thing, too, about Billy. Billy and I, as I think I mentioned, was in the Frank Corsair class. Yeah. And he had, I had invited him to a party that Marty was also going to be at. And I introduced him to Marty before that. And Billy sang a song. 
And uh, so Billy did a fabulous job. Everybody in that picture did a great job. Uh, and one thing I would just like to say about that, if I may, the, the, movie, the movie, I get to Phoenix. And so that night after supper, I'm walking home across the motel grounds and Marty is coming out or going into his motel room. He said, Harry, come in, come on in. Let's talk about the uh, scene we're going to shoot tomorrow. So I went in there and he only had one other book in the suite, uh, the outer room. Uh, I'm sure there was a bedroom back there, but uh, outside in that uh, living room, if, if that's what it was, there was one book and that was the poetry and prose of William Blake. And you remember in Mean Streets, Tiger, Tiger, you know, the yes. tiger and all that. And Scorsese, right. you know, he has that same type of energy as William Blake, you know, Blake said, energy is eternal delight. And you walk alongside of Marty, and you just feel this, you know, just like his movies, you see, feel this tremendous energy inside mm. of himself. And so he's, he, he got out the script, and he looked at it, he said, we'll just keep it simple. And then he, uh, he told me something interesting about his vision. He said, I'm shooting each scene with a parable behind it. I mean, you know, we know he was a religious person. Right. And then we got on the set the next day, he, I, I walked in and I, the clothes I was wearing were things that I chose. As I said earlier, I worked in a you know, waiter in New York City and this guy was a bartender, Jim's, Jim and Joe's bartender. So I had a, a Navy shirt, you know, like the one Christopher Jones used to wear, mm. and a white uh, cross tie. I knew Marty would like it, you know, the cross and all that. And I wore my jeans and boots and Marty loved the clothes. And then, so right before we shot it, he said to me, uh, I'm gonna shoot this film. Uh, this is a close up, so don't move much. And then he said, I'm gonna shoot this. Uh, the red lights up above it will reflect off your blue shirt. So I'm just standing there thinking, you know, he's got everything covered and it just right. made me feel so relaxed. And then we, uh, he, he introduced me to Ellen and then I just said hello and I went, I didn't want to hang out with her because I wanted to just do the scene as if it were the first time. Right, right. And that came out really good. And then, you, you know, months later, I saw Marty at Warner Brothers and he said that that was the only scene that he shot that was also on the screen one-to-one. -one. You know, he didn't touch, you know, whatever it was he shot was on the screen one-to-one. -one. Well, the, what I love so much about that that scene is, you know, because I, I think what's so great about 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 you as an actor, Harry, is is how much behavior you bring to the scene. Because when she says to you, I, I'm a singer looking for a job, you, you begin to laugh. <laughs> You're like amused that this woman would be looking you know for for a job in this bar as a singer uh but then you're you're intrigued at the same time when you say are you are you really a singer so you know i i now did that just come out of doing the scene the fact that you sort of were amused by the fact that she was looking for a singing job or or was scorsese specific with you taking it that way i don't know if you if you would remember or not you know i do remember scorsese has never really indicated for me to do anything other than just what I do. Right, as you one, mentioned, yeah. The only two things I ever remember one time in taxi driver, I put my hands up like this to describe something. He said, don't put your hands up like that. And then, and then the first scene in taxi driver was a six page scene and I was, I hadn't worked for a couple of months. I was somewhat hyper and he just came over and put his hands on my shoulder and just said, relax. Those are the only two things. He always really liked me, but uh, I just, you know, I had worked in that position before, as I said, so I knew what this character would feel like. And here comes right. a person into the into the place. And so I just really basically listened to Ellen. Mm, mm. No, it's a it's a really, really wonderful scene. Um, jumping into uh, Taxi Driver, you know, I watched this again the other night because I, I, I mean, I've seen it several times, but it had been a while. And <laughs> of course, I have this one as well. And uh, when I what I like so much about the film, I mean, people talk about how, you know, dark and dramatic it is, but there's also a lot of comedy, a lot of, you know, real dark comedy, of course, from that decade. And I think a, a lot of the, the comedy comes from those scenes with you and Peter and, and De Niro in the, the, the cafeteria. Um, so I, I know that there was improvisation done you know, in the rehearsals, which was scripted and then, and, you know, the, was then, you know, re, re, the, the improvs were then scripted and then that's, that's what you shot. So um, is, is that what you, what you remember basically 
Scorsese not sticking to exactly what Paul Schrader wrote and that you all sort of were able to contribute improvisation and then shot the improvs, basically? You know, when Marty called me in to come to Columbia, which is right next to Warner Brothers, the Burbank Studios, he gave me the script and he said to me several things. He said, first of all, he said, uh, when I thought about uh, Travis, I, my number one choice was De Niro, Harvey, number two, you number three. I gave it to De Niro. I want you to play Doughboy. And then he said to me, I'm going to shoot dope. I'm going to shoot taxi driver in such a surreal way. No one ever has before. Mm -hmm. Two, he said, I'm going to shoot taxi driver like a gothic horror movie. And three, he said, I'm going to use those garish B fifties B movies, uh, colors. And then he said to me, uh, the dialogue is too straight. You know, the way we like to work sideways. Right. So I, I had, I had also driven a cab at one time. So I knew a lot more than anybody really about it about driving a cab. So for example, the first line in the script was, you know, when Peter Boy says, uh, Travis, do you know Doughboy? And my, or vice versa, uh, I, in the script it was, yeah, we went to Harvard together. So I threw in a line that I heard a cabbie say to me one time, hey, Travis, you got changed for a nickel. <laughs> and then, you know, and then, you know, the, the things with Peter Boyle and me, those were improv. Right. And, uh, so the other thing, uh, Peter Boyle and I shared a big RV and for two and a half weeks, and he was just one of these witty guys who could make me laugh. So yeah. I'm sitting there and he starts carrying on about the woman, you know, he hops in the back seat with, et cetera. And then he, he gets me laughing. So we, you know, we, we improved a lot in that particular picture. Obviously you can't, the thing about doing a movie, a script's around for a while and yeah. then you can freshen up the dialogue in this case you can't change the action you know the action that I, when i got the script i realized okay i'm part, i'm the guy who gets you know drives De Niro to get the gun so or guns yeah. so i knew i wouldn't be cut out you know that's always you know they always have to go with that and uh so that made me feel good and and marty loved what i did yeah no it's it's really really wonderfully done uh so uh i i imagine those like were those improvs were they sh directly shot on set or did you already do that in rehearsal and then they gave you the sides and was that was that how those improvs came to be on the screen or was it just done right on the set we were sh you know we were shot at night in new york those scenes so it's like nine o'clock to five o'clock in new york in the summer and then so at six o'clock peter Boyle and i would meet at marty's suite at the saint regis on the 17th floor and he would have an assistant there and she would record everything. So Peter Boy would come with a big yellow legal pad. And then whatever he would say, I would come up something better. You know, he'd just say maybe, I don't know if it's in the script, like I had a guy the other day who had a dog and the dog threw up on my back seat. And I'd say, well, I always charge him five bucks to clean up the mess. Whatever it was, you know, you're right. talking about two guys in the back seat fighting, you so and so and you so and so. Mm -hmm. And I would come up with the line in there where I got a laugh. And uh so I so they take all that material plus the script in the script, the dialogue in the script, and then they would uh, when we arrived on the set about eight thirty, the uh, you know Marty or the assistant would give us the new script, so we'd have that. I so see, I see. And, and then we would also work improv from from that. I see, I see. And you you said something interesting was that you know here you were with De Niro and Scorsese, you know the you know, the biggest, some of the, you know, two of the biggest and best talent at that time. And so you felt, well, may, maybe the other cab driver should be even crazier than Travis. And I think that, you know, I mean, you certainly, you and Boyle and everybody certainly accomplished, accomplished that. Um, where, how did you, you know, that's such a great instinct. And again, we're talking about your, your inventiveness and how did you come up with something like that? Like, did that just kind of come right out of your gut to think, okay, let's see if we can make these guys a little nuttier than Travis, or how, how did how did that come to you? And at that time, I was living in West Hollywood, and I remember one night, this vision, you know, one of my favorite sayings is from a title of a short story by Delmore Schwartz, and dreams begin responsibilities. So I believe as an artist, a poet or an actor, you get these visions or you get lines coming to you, and obviously it has to fit into the vision of the director, but at one point when I got the idea to, to sell De Niro a piece of Errol Flynn's bathtub, I thought, well, what happens if I do this? And they, right. he or, or Marty said, no, you can't do that. And I said, look, I can't 
worry about other people. All I can do is do my character and get these and be prepared and allow that. And so when I told Marty after that first scene that I was going to leave and then I said, I'm gonna leave in this scene. How about if I come back and I had the piece of Errol Flynn's tile with me and I pulled it out and I get, ran the dialogue down to him. And then uh, after I try to sell it to De Niro, I will exit. And I said, you don't have to do a new setup because obviously 45 minutes to do a new setup you know, they don't want to take the time. So I said, if you don't like it, you can just cut it. Marty said, right. I love it. Right. And then, as you know, at the end, Gennaro just kind of shakes his head and says no. And <laughs> yeah. so that, you know, and I did it, as you mentioned earlier, because I, I thought, you know, if you and I met in a cab stand and I tried to sell you a gun, you might think is Harry an undercover uh, right. guy. So I thought, I got to try to show him I'm like I'm sicker than he is. And in the future, uh, somebody is going to try to sell somebody a piece of Robert De Niro's clothing, you know, right. that whole thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it works so beautifully. I, I even love the way De Niro responds to you. Like he's looking at you like, like you're absolutely insane uh, to the, to try to get him to sell a piece of Errol Flynn's uh, uh, bathtub. No, no, it's really, it's, it's, it's so, so good. You could do a whole mini series just on those guys in the, in that cafeteria. Uh, uh, it's beautifully, beautifully done. What, at what point did you move to LA from New York? 1968. Let me just say one last thing. About oh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Taxi driver. The other thing that I noticed about being an actor, okay, the lead, they dress the leads in primary colors usually, and then the, the supporting actors, they kind of subdue their clothing because they want the focus to be on the main guys. So I, there was a scene in Taxi Driver right at the end, or toward the end, Belmore Cafeteria, De Niro, Peter Boyle, myself, and another actor. And I, I thought, okay, this scene, and then pretty soon De Niro's gonna start killing people. So I thought, I'll go buy a red shirt. So right. I went down to 42nd and got a red shirt. So you have red, and Marty, as we know, love loves red. So you have red shirt, red blood. So subliminally, so all those, you know, being up like Scorsese or Fellini, a painter too, they're, they're, they, they're very interested in, you know, the whole visual, obviously. So that's one thing. I, I moved to LA with my first wife in 1968 because I wanted a fresh start. I wanted to try to get acting work out here, which I did. I wanted to do Westerns, which I did a few, and I wanted to have a son. Uh, so that, that was the reason I moved to Santa Monica in 1968. I see. Okay. And did you, because I know that in, in New York, you, you had done a, a number of plays. Did you continue to do theater off and on? You know, one thing I found, Robert, in L.A. or any place, New York, it's just as hard to get a lead in a movie as a lead in a play right, or a small right. part. In, they, everybody has people they know. So I auditioned once for the lead in Look Homeward Angel at a real good theater. I didn't get that. But then in 1987, I did The, Fa the Father in Fool for Love. So that was the only play I did in New York. And once I, you know, I started out in theater. But for me, I've always loved movies. I like the intimate reality better of movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, sorry, I, just touching back on um, Taxi Driver, did you, because I know that you later worked with Paul Schrader on his directorial debut, uh, Blue Collar, did you get to know him at all on Taxi Driver or was it not till later? You know, the, I, I never met Paul on that script, on that shoot. I saw okay. him when he hired me for Blue Collar, but the, you know, one night Marty asked me to eat at the stage deli. And so it was Marty and me and De Niro and Peter Boyle and Brian De Palma and Michael, Michael Phillips, the producer. Right. So, those, you know, those are about the only people, you know, De Palma outside of the cast that I, I met. Well, Blue Collar, I mean, this is, uh, I have this as well. This is such a great, um, really, really great film. I watched it again a few months ago because I hadn't seen it in a number of years because uh, I just got it on on uh, Blu-ray and uh, you play Hank uh, in this film. That last shot is so memorable. I, that's one shot that I've never forgotten as Keitel and Richard Pryor are about to just, you know, knock each other with wrenches. It's, and, and then and you're, you're in that, that, that same scene as everyone's watching this fight escalate and he freezes on it. It's so, so, it's so, so memorable. Um, you, you may not want to uh, want to talk about this because I know this was a pretty wild shoot. Uh, is there is there any, is there anything you 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 care to share about it or? <laughs> well, you know, there's so many things that happened that I'd like to talk to you about off camera. But I would say that <laughs> right. Schrader's first directorial job. You know, I worked for Scorsese, his first film feature, 
uh, Paul Schrader, Charles Eastman, the All-American boy, and Drew Denbaum, Nickel Mountain. What I noticed about Schrader, it had a strong structure. And I thought of the three main people, Harvey, Pryor, and Yafit Koto, I thought that of all, you know, I love Harvey. He's always been good to me. I thought uh, Peter or, uh, you know, uh, uh, Richard Pryor, I thought he really, he may have, maybe it's just the role that he ended up with that role uh, who comes out ahead, you know, but uh, they were all three great, but I think yeah. Pryor kind of, I don't know, he's trying to stand up for the African-American race and, you know, his whole work, you know, he was really good in that, but everybody was good. It was really good. Yeah. It was, it was I'll just say it was like for two months, it was like a party. I <laughs> and we came to Detroit looking pretty. We left looking raggedy. <laughs> Well, you know, there's something that I, I noticed. I, I was just I went uh, I, I was just going through it uh, recently because I just wa I wanted to look at your moments, uh, your scenes in it. And something that I noticed Schrader did was even if if you were in the the background having a conversation, I, I could hear all those all those the the dialogues, which you know usually, as you know, uh, they'll they'll try to bring those conversations down. I mean, sometimes they really did focus on what you were saying because it was important, like the fact that uh, Richard Pryor gets that promotion and it, towards the end you say, oh, I wonder how he got that. They cut to you. But often those conversations in the bar, because, uh, you know, the main characters are, are obviously they, they, they rob the place, so they're trying to, to, to hide, but they, they always have you guys, you and everybody else as such a presence. And I, could, uh, I thought it was interesting that the dialogue was actually very, very clear as to as to what you were saying, so do you do you recall um, how that worked? Was that just right in the script and you did it, or was there improvisation incorporated? There was a little improvisation. You know, one time there's a scene where Peter Bo or uh, Richard Pryor yells over to me. He said, I was by the jukebox, and he says, "Hey, Hank, put something in there." Oh, yeah. And yeah, we did yeah, a bunch yeah, of yeah. different improv scenes, and I said. To him at one time, I said, you know, go get a quarter from your welfare mom. You don't want to listen to nothing and play what you want to play. You don't want to listen to nothing but your own noise. And right, he looked right. at Ed Bago and them and he said, I never did like that SOB. But, you know, he was funny and I always loved Richard Pryor. And then, you know, one thing that that day that that happened, he literally walked off the set and we didn't shoot the rest of the day. And that's a whole other story. But right. I was thankful to work for Schrader. One thing that Scorsese did that Schrader commented about. He said, Marty, if you were playing a smaller part, he always gave each person an equal amount. He didn't use a smaller part as a transition to get to somebody else. Right. So that's a pretty good uh, element to have. Do you, um, have you seen Harvey Keitel at all in, in the last while? Do you remember the last time you, or do you still keep in touch with him? You know, I haven't seen Harvey for quite a while. There's an acting teacher that lives here at MPTF, and he was teaching in Paris uh, when the, the Irishman came out. And so Marty or uh, Harvey and De Niro and uh, Barry Primus stopped and had lunch with this acting teacher. And he sent me a card and he said, Harvey said, you know, every time there's a film that I think Har Harry's right for, I recommend it, Harry. And he recommended, as you know, for Scorsese's first film, Blue Collar, yeah. uh, you know, a couple other pictures. So I always... I always uh, love Harvey. He's a great, he's a great person. Yeah, he's one of my, he's one of my favorites. He's such a fantastic actor. And I, I know you mentioned you, you last saw Scorsese when right before he got the Cecil B. DeMille Award. So that was, I think that was 2010, I believe, something like that. Yeah, that, that was a lot. That was, uh, do you, was it, was it a, a short uh, conversation or was it, was it, what was, what was it like to see him again? You know, that, were, that place was like Times Square as a Chateau Marmont. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, I saw everybody there, Stuart Whitman, you know, people like that. And, and uh, you know, so it was so jammed. But I did see Marty as I was leaving with my wife. He was surrounded by a couple of sofas and, you know, his wife and a, a, a woman assistant. So I just had to reach over a sofa. That was a little area that was, he was kind of protected. And, I, you know, shook his hand and talked with him a little well. And uh, one Italian actor, Joe Cartizzi, who was there too. He said, well, you got to talk to Marty. <laughs> well, I work with him. But yeah. I always love Marty. And obviously you, you, you just love working with a great director. And I, you know, Marty started out and now I believe he's like the statesman for American film. 
Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I just saw for the first time, I had never seen it before, uh, the uh, television show you did with a mirror, Mi the episode was called Mirror Mirror on Amazing Stories. Uh, that was that was a really good episode. I mean, that's pretty wacky. I, I, I thought it was really, really good. What, what do you remember about that? You, you were the security guard. Uh, I, you had, know, I hadn't seen Marty uh, for a while and my agent sent me up. So I w draw, wore a suit and tie, at unit, went to Universal, Spielberg produced that series. And so Marty sees me, takes me inside. And this is one of the strangest jobs I ever got in terms of the way I got it. There's a producer sitting, not Spielberg, behind the desk and Marty and I on a sofa. So Marty has the script in his hand and it's about a you know 26 page script for a half hour. And uh, he's, my scene is like three pages with uh, Sam Watterson yeah. as a light scene. So Marty says, Harry's gonna play the security guard as you mentioned. And he starts reading the dialogue. You know, Sam said this. Harry says that he flips a page, reads the dialogue, flips a page. Re he read all the dialogue. I didn't even open my mouth. And then after it was all over, Marty looked at the producer and said, see, isn't Harry great? <laughs> <laughs> I had not read one word. And then, then we were on the set and there was, uh, you know, I was dressed as a security guard and there was Helen Shaver and Sam Watterson. And a real security, security guard came over to me and asked me, you know, what? What are you, you know, what, are you taking care of this? He thought I was a security guard. And Marty oh. says, see, I, I told you. And then one last little <laughs> thing about after the fight, you know, where I got knocked around a little bit and so did Sam Watterson, the nurse came over to me and she said, you know, I've been working on TV for 30 years and I've never seen a director as sensitive as Scorsese is toward the actors. Oh, that's great. I love that. That's that's great. That's great to hear. I, I love when you hear that people are, are good to work with as opposed to <laughs> being a nightmare to work with. So, no, that's that's good to hear. Um, you know, I I I must be honest because I hadn't heard of Over the Edge before. And when you agreed to uh, come on the show, uh, I got your email from uh, Mike White on the product uh, the uh, podcaster from the uh, Projection Booth podcast, which is a show I love. And uh, and and he told me about this episode. Where you that you did, where you talked about Over the Edge. This was directed by Jonathan Kaplan, and I watched it recently. And wow, that is such a great, that is such a great movie. And what I what I really liked about what you again what you did in that is, uh, I, I imagine perhaps it would have it would have been easy to just play play that guy like he's so, like a bad cop. But uh, I, I I really felt that you really cared about those kids. I mean, you really. Uh, wanted the best for them, but your character was just not equipped to know how to communicate. Just his way of of doing things was throwing these kids in jail or pushing them around. But um, I, 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 you had a, a really great scene, particularly after you shot um, Matt Dillon, because uh, because he had a gun on you. And when that when that woman was getting mad at you, and and you really stood up for yourself. Um, the conviction of, of how you said you actually did care. I mean, I really believed it. I mean, I, I thought it was really wonderfully done. D is that how you approached it? That this man cared, but he just wasn't equipped to, you know, deal with these kids very well? You know, I grew up in, in a little town in Nebraska and I got in trouble as a kid. If I would have been in a city, I might end up in jail. But I, my oldest brother was FBI agent. And then also... Uh, I had done boxcar birthday sheriff and uh, fighting mad. I starred in a Corman picture for Jonathan Demi. So I'd done a couple of uh, you know law enforcement characters. So my thinking was simply that I'm going to think uh, uh, law enforcement. You have to think very clearly. No no room for ambiguity. And I thought you know if somebody pulls a gun on me, I'm going to pull a gun on him and take right, him out. Right. So it was really right. just. I always looked at myself as a straight arrow, and I always looked. You know, unfortunately for me, I mean, a lot of people call me names for playing that character, but um, he was a good guy, but the film was shot through the eyes of the kids. Right, and, right. You know, the point of view, but I, you know, I, Kaplan came up to me in the outer office when I was auditioning the first time for it, and there were some big name people out there in the lobby or the outer office, and so he comes up to me, crouched down, he said, Harry, I want you for this role. You got to go in there with four balls. You got to look at the producer. You got to show warmth to him. You got to make him like you. And then the other time later on, he told me, he said, I saw you and Alice doesn't live here anymore. You know, he studied with Scorsese at NYU. And he said, when I saw you and Alice, I thought you were just some natural guy. Scorsese hired off the, hired off the street. And I didn't know you're an actor. But he said, ever since that time, I've been wanting to use you. And also I was told that Scorsese 
recommended me also with Sandy Weintraub for to do that role. So I'm always that's the only time in my life I ever got top billing. Right, right. When when you said people people got called you names for doing the part after, is that what you mean? Well, you know, if, say if you look at an over the edge site somewhere, there will be uh, you know kids who were ten or twelve or fourteen when that picture came out, and they would write things like, "Oh, Harry's a." you know, Sergeant Doberman, and you can put in the blanks, you know, he's a so-and-so. Oh, you know, I see. Kind of name. So it wasn't me personally. The uh, character, yeah. The character, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, well, that, that's how convincing you were that the kids hated you, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I know you said this as well, but it reminded me so much of Rebel Without a Cause. You know, it's like a, it was like a, a rated R, you know, rougher, edgier version of... Uh, of rebel without a cause. And I thought, I mean, I thought the cat, the cast was so, you know, they really got kids that were the actual age. Cause I know you said this as well, like, you know, Dean is great in rebel, but he was like 24 playing 17 or 18. Um, but these kids, I mean, Matt Dillon, he was for, he was about 14. I mean, when he, they were all the same, exactly that age. I thought that was wonderfully done. Yeah. Well, you know, my favorite pictures in those ty type of teen movies, Los Al Al Alvidados by Buñuel, Rebel, yeah. and then the, and then uh, over the edge. You know, Jodie Foster. I just worked with her for MPTF 100th Gala, and we talked about working with Scorsese and Demi on stage. And one thing about um, oh, about what was it about? Oh, 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 oh over the edge. Oh, jo Jody had seen Over the Edge uh, before she worked with uh, Kaplan on The Accused, which she won the Academy Award. Right. And she said that was the only teen movie that made any sense to her. And that's why she wanted to work with Kaplan. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. No, she's, uh, she's, she's such a good actor. I was, wa I was just watching Silence of the Lambs again recently, which of, of course uh, you're in. Um, I, I like the story you told that she, she was talking about how the close-ups were so extreme, the ECUs that uh, Demi was doing, but they're so, they're so beautiful. They're so, they're so intimate and, and, per and emotional. I mean, I thought he, I thought he uh, uh, shot, uh, you know, really framed that uh, so, so well. What, what do you remember about working on Silence of the Lambs? You know, I got the part about two and a half months before, you know, when the book, when I saw Scorsese or Demi was going to direct it, I, I bought the book, you know, it was in its 47th printing. I read it and, I, and the, in the book, there was a whole chapter on Mr. Bimmel, the part I played. He was the, Big, uh, father of the first victim, Frederica. So I started working on, uh, you know, nail, nailing in the script. My uh, character was uh, building a, a elongation to the pigeon coop, and then so I did that. I also got a pigeon from a friend of mine who raised pigeons, and I would take the pigeon inside with me every day for about an hour. And you know, you have to hold them because they go to the bathroom all the time, so that you know they're facing a certain way that don't get on you. And so I really got into that. And then I, I wore the clothes that I chose on the set. And so I, as I remember just going to do the show, uh, I oh, here's what I did. Uh, you know, in the script, as I said, that's what Mr. Bimmel was doing. But I was sitting in a coffee shop one time uh, in West East Hollywood. And I wrote down one of those paper napkins that instead of doing that, I will have my character holding a white pigeon up toward the sun looking for mites. I thought that would be a nice visual. So I remember going to the set uh, and, and Demi comes up to me and said, Harry, what do you want to do on this? So I literally pulled that out of my pocket and read it to him. He did great. And then so Jody comes, she said that, you know, Harry, Demi's shooting it like yeah. this, does that bother you? And I said, it don't bother me. And then later on, I learned watching the picture that you see the picture, that's what Jody sees. Right. Yeah, that's her, point it's her POV, me. yeah. Yeah. And then, I'll, you know, one other brief thing, the production designer asked me for pictures of my earlier life with my own son so a lot of those pictures when she goes upstairs and go around they're pictures of my little boy dylan oh. and, and pictures of me and so you know that and anything you can do the mm. clothes you wear you know obviously the emotional choices you make in this case the visual uh, photos that, that all helps you to be more helps you believe yes. more in what you're doing Yes, yes, no, absolutely. Well, it, it worked. It worked beautifully. Um, just just lastly, uh, I, I was curious, you know, you, you were you, you were in you, you've been in the industry for so, so long. Were, were there any 
I mean, you, you have so many credits, so I imagine the answer is uh, perhaps no, but were there, were there any lean times? Were there any difficult times where, uh, where, you know, jobs just weren't coming or what, or how, how was that generally? That happened a lot. You know, I made, I made a modest living as an actor, as you know, for 34 years, 37 films, more TV shows than that. Yeah. But I, uh, you know, I get some good jobs, 10 week job, used cars, eight weeks, blue collar, you know, on and on. Yes. But then, uh, so you work and you think the money is never going to end, that it ends. So then you draw on employment. But one thing that happened to me, I never really worried. Obviously, you have to pay the rent, but I never really worried about money. I, I could off the top of my head list about seven times where I was down to like seven dollars in the bank and a film would come through. I believe if you're on your journey, my journey, actor and poet, that something will come through to keep you on that journey. Mm -hmm. And so it was it's like a faith and it's just a passion. And it's just a focus. And I also did a lot of work. I was always writing letters to directors, uh, casting directors. You know, my agent, she's great. But I some of those big directors, the agent can't get to them. So I was right. always doing hustling all the time. I mean, I was every day, every minute of the day, I was thinking, how can I get to this yeah. particular director? Right. Right. No, that's a great, that's a great way to, to, to go about it. Um, just, and has, has acting influenced your, your, your writing as a poet? Well, you know, I've written one of my subjects in my poetry has been working as a film actor. I would say yes. Uh, but the other, on the other hand, I would also say working as a poet, the thing about being a poet, you have to learn to use time and space well and be very concise. So that helped me, that confidence helped me when I went on a set I was always prepared. Like when I did Doughboy and Taxi Driver, the clothes I wore, I had worn as a cabbie. I had my, uh, what do you call it? Like clipboard that I used as a cabbie. I had my uh, driver's light, you know, cabbie license. I had my little transistor sister that I used. You know, in those days, it was a big deal. I had my Bull Durham that I would roll, you know, look like joints, but they were Bull Durham. And so I, I, it helps me. Well, I think as you know, being an acting teacher and an actor, you do everything you can to help you believe in the script. And then that helps uh, the audience believe in it too. And yes. it gives you more confidence in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Um, if what, what would you, what would, what would your advice be for someone who wants to become an actor? Any, any advice you want to share? You know, I grew up in a little town, Nebraska, and I, I always thought if you really want to be a serious actor, you go to New York city and study acting. Right. Uh, just a good looking, you know, you know, homecoming king or whatever football quarterback. Yeah, you, know, you go to New York like a raw rock Hudson type of guy. And, you know, if you have confidence, you can do that. But I always I like people who actually study and really take their craft seriously. Mm -hmm. and so I, I got five years. I studied with Franco Serra doing scene after scene after scene. I would walk through intersections in New York and I wouldn't even be aware of traffic. I'd be doing my lines. So I would just say. You focus, you do everything you can to contact people. But, you know, most of all, I think it's important to study with a great director or mm -hmm. a great acting teacher and then try to get try to get work with the great directors because they're the ones, you know, who are whose films will last. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Very well said. Well, Harry, thanks so much. I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I really appreciate that you took the time to come on and share these uh, really wonderful stories uh, of, of working with some of the best, uh, you know, directors and actors, you know, we could, we could talk for hours. So uh, hopefully we could, uh, I could have you again sometime down the road, but thanks so much for, for your time. I really appreciate it. Well, I love, I love the preparation that you do too. I love all those films you held up to show and I can <laughs> yeah. see you love filming. You have so much erudition about acting. So I'm grateful to be here. And, you know, anytime you want me to talk again, I would love to talk to you and so thank you very much, Robert. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and or listening. If you are currently listening to this on the audio version of my YouTube video podcast and you've run out of episodes to listen to, head over to the YouTube channel where every single episode that I have ever recorded can be found, youtube.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies. I want to thank all of my members on Patreon. If you are interested in becoming a member of my Patreon, 
head over to the link patreon.com slash Robert Bellissimo at the movies for full details. Patreon is bonus content that I create month in and month out, and it is based on polls that I put out at the beginning of every single month, which as a member, you will have access to vote on. So if you like my work and you're interested in supporting me over on Patreon, head over to the link for full details. You can also leave a donation directly to the YouTube channel by looking right underneath, right underneath the video. You will see the like, dislike, comment buttons, and beside those buttons, there will be a link that will say thanks. Click the thanks tab, and from there, feel free to leave a donation if you wish. And lastly, if this is your first time here, please consider subscribing to my YouTube video podcast, which again, it is absolutely free to do so, by pressing the Robert Bellissimo at the Movies logo. You will see it floating above my head in the top left corner to your top left. In just a second, just click on that. And then click the bell in order to get a notification every time I release one of my new episodes or when I go live. Thank you so much, everyone.